Good evening. Uh, my name is Bonnie Roy. I'm the Emergency um, Management Director for the um, offices in Agawam, Regions 3 4 for MEMA. Kristen Jerome is our local coordinator for Region 4, which is Worcester County. Um, and we're going to talk to you a little bit today about emergency preparedness. So, who do we serve? We serve all residents. Um, we also work with colleges, universities, communities, businesses. Basically, anybody in the state of Massachusetts that has problems with emergencies are people mm -hmm. that we um, support. We work with our federal and local partners. Um, we work with FEMA. We work with other state agencies, um, Mass DOT, Mass State Police, National Guard, and um, our nonprofits, Salvation Army, Red Cross. Um, we just unfortunately had a fire in Whit Fitchburg yesterday. Mm -hmm. And um, we're working with the community to set up a resource recovery center so the community members that were affected by the fire can come in and meet with a lot of different state agencies um, and help be made whole. So some of those would be like Division of Insurance, uh, Salvation Army, things like that. So this is some of what we do. And since there's not a disaster every day, um, Thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> we, Thankfully. We, do, we do have day to day activities. It was funny, um, I got home a couple days ago and there was a bunch of little kids next door and they saw my car, which is, has the sirens and the lights and the logo on the mm -hmm. side. And they came running up and they asked if I was a police officer. And I said, no, I said, I'm emergency management. So they were like, what's that? I said, well, you know, like if there's a tornado, we help out. And they were like, but there's not a tornado now. Mm -hmm. So, and how do you explain to little kids what we do every day? It's hard enough sometimes explaining to adults. I generally use the line, we're like FEMA, but we're MEMA. Um, so this, this is kind of what we do every day. We work with the communities and other state agencies to make sure they have all hazards plans in place. So um, we're out there, we're talking to them about putting together an emergency management team in their community um, with their, all their department heads. Um, anybody that's nonprofit, their schools. So they can all come together, they can work on writing a plan and make sure that the plan um, will take care of them during a disaster. And then once they have the plan written, we provide all hazard training. So we'll have, we start off with tabletop exercises where we bring people together um, and they um, go over different sections of the plan, they talk through it, they find you know, maybe there's places where there's gaps and then they um, can rewrite the plan. And then it moves up to, you know, we've done functional training where, you know, you roll, you roll the fire trucks, you roll the ambulances, you set up the bear cage, you set up a shelter. Um, we help with all that. Monitoring events statewide. Uh, we have a dispatch. Our dispatch is operational 24-7. Um, it answers for a lot of state agencies. Um, we have a duty officer. So if you call one of our offices, um, you will automatically get, if it's after hours, it'll transfer you to dispatch. And then the communities, um, if they have an issue, can get a hold of the duty officer. And then we can send people out like the local coordinators to help um, the towns in the event of emergency. And then we act as a state warning point. So when you get those alerts messages and everything else, they'll come through our dispatch. So a lot of the, um, the weather alerts and wireless the, emergency alerts those all come through our alerts, dispatch. Those alerts, when your phone all of a sudden goes, yes. yeah. 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 Do you do that by um, area code, how do you know? Or is it people who are in the area regardless of area? So what they do is if there's, if there's a, um, something happening in one part of town, they can draw, it, it, it's basically using GIS and they draw a circle around the area that they want to warn. Oh, and then they, they craft the alert and they send it out. So any cell phone that's within that area will get the alert. So if it pings off the towers that are within yep. that vicinity, then you'll so, get the alert. So it's not necessarily um, just people that live there. So if you're a visitor, if you happen to be in that area, then you'll also get that alert. Mm -hmm. Someone I knew in, Har who was in Harwich, mm -hmm. um, even though they were from far away, got the alert. From right, with yep. the tornadoes, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, that's um, one of the other things we do. And your local communities probably have alert, alert systems too. A lot of them, you know, code red or reverse 911. Those yep. are tied to your, your zip codes and your addresses. Mm -hmm. um, ours are, can be... Like a geographic location, like right. kind of drawing a circle on a map and then ping that area. I 
I think yep. in Northboro, I think you have to opt in to code red. Right, or yep, red. yeah. yeah. Um, and then some, some are nationwide alerts. Mm -hmm. So tornadoes are automatic, everybody gets them. Um, flash flooding is automatic, and I think the Amber Alerts are automatic. Yeah. They, they don't need a geographic code, they just basically go out to everybody in the area. Um, so basically, all disasters happen locally. Your town needs to be prepared, you need to be prepared at that first level, you know, so, and then your town has to be prepared once they can't handle what they're doing, they call us and then so forth. We reach out to the federal government if it becomes too much for the state. But the bottom line is it's going to happen here first. And so you guys are going to have to be the ones that um, are prepared. And FEMA has that recommendation, 72 hours um, is generally the time when you're preparing your emergency kit, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, that you want to be prepared um, to be on your own for up to 72 hours after a disaster. And that's about how long they figure it can get aid to get rolling and get into places. You know, and unfortunately, some places where the infrastructure is damaged, it might even be longer. Um, you know, obviously, Puerto Rico was an example of that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Bahamas, which is not the United States, but um, mm -hmm. so you want to make sure that you have a plan in place for yourself, which is what we'll talk about in a few minutes. So, some of the disasters that have happened in Massachusetts. Now, not every disaster is a federally declared disaster. Um, we have to reach a certain dollar point threshold. Most of the disasters that happen in Massachusetts aren't federally declared, but the, the state still has to respond. The community still have to respond. So all the disasters I'm going to show you, the next three, um, weren't, weren't um, a federal disaster. So these are the Cape Cod tornadoes just this past summer, uh, luckily. Uh, no one was really injured. It was just mostly debris damage. And then unfortunately the one poor hotel that lost its roof. Um, but it was, it took them about a week to clean the debris. The, um, and the power came on within two days, I think was the longest they were without power. In that case, uh, would the local business owners still get some federal dollars no. reimbursement? No, they, they, um, they might, sometimes they can be eligible for an SBA Small Business Administration loan, um, which will allow them a loan to rebuild. Um, but generally that also has to reach a threshold of so many businesses. So unfortunately for that person, it would just be their insurance yeah. um, covering it. Yeah, because it can cover like lost wages and stuff like that. But it, again, it falls within, you know, it has to be a certain threshold. There has to be a certain amount of businesses that were affected, a certain amount of days. Um, so then we have the Lawrence gas explosion. So that went on a lot longer. Um, people were displaced up to three months. The state, you know, moved in and helped. Um, well, actually, the gas company paid for it all. But the state helped um, organize temporary housing in hotels, um, in trailer parks. They brought in RVs to house some of the residents. Um, and then they also had a, a thousand person shelter open for anybody that you know, needed sheltering beyond that. Um, so again, these were people that couldn't go back to their homes for up to three months. So it, it's something, you know, it can happen. And then we had one in Worcester County in 2018, the Webster Dudley tornadoes. And there are two separate tornadoes a week apart. The first one hit Dudley. Um, that was mainly debris damage. Um, and it, the power was out for a couple of days. You know, some homes had roof damage. Unfortunately, a week later, the Webster one hit, and that took out a big chunk of Main Street, as you can see. And they ended up having to demolish um, an apartment, two apartment buildings. Um, so, you know, those people were, uh, had to find, you know, permanent housing somewhere else. Again, there, uh, we opened a resource recovery center um, to help with, you know, getting them immediate needs um, and um, working with some of the rental agencies to find them housing to move forward with. So basically, these are all things that have happened in Massachusetts within a year. So it's one thing, this is why we are, you know, talking about being prepared. Is the Resource Recovery Center a temporary location, a mobile location? Or it, it, it's generally in a, in a community building, usually a senior center um, or a library. 
uh, the one on Wednesday that we're doing is going to be Knights of Columbus. Knights of Columbus. So yeah, we usually look for some place that has room where because we, we set up tables and chairs, make kind of like stations. Yeah. So there's the different agencies um, and nonprofits people can go talk to. And so it could be anything from like a library, senior center, town halls we've used. Um, this time, like I said, Knights of Columbus, senior, yeah, yeah. senior center in Sturbridge, we did that one. Yep. Oops, I think we went too far. Oh, was it going on its own? Yeah, it decided to move forward on its own when I wasn't looking. <laughs> so um, again, with this, we, and we've been doing this for many years. So this was our first mobile command center back in 1964. Um, we had one of our um, local coordinators from our Region 2 office, which is uh, South, uh, South Coast, retired today. He remembers working oh. in this for flooding in Boston oh, no. oh. Back, yeah. back in the 60s. And back then we were called um, Civil Defense. Yes. So we are a Civil Defense Agency back then. Yeah. <laughs> and this is part of what our fleet looks like today. So we have, um, um, this is our mobile um, emergency operations center. We have two of them. So we can bring them if we brought them. <laughs> we brought them out to Dudley um, so that we can stage near where the um, incident is. And then we have a place for the town um, unified command where police, fire, emergency management can come together and, and plan their response. So we have two of those. We also have, um, a mobile command, a mobile MCST uh, communications. communications trailer. <laughs> so um, that can be used for uh, dispatch if um, during the tornado in 2011 in the western part of the state, Munson lost their dispatch center. So you know we can bring that out if they have to dispatch um, until they can get it repaired. We also have shelter trailers um, with cots, and we have pet shelter trailers with pet sheltering supplies. Um, so we have a lot of resources, um, and, and your emergency management directors generally know what resources we have, but those what we have available to help the communities. Helping uh, communities, you know, especially like Katrina and in Houston, the issue of pets is a huge issue, right. isn't it? Yes. Because a lot of right. those pets were abandoned. Or right, and, and that, that changed the law, Katrina changed mm -hmm. the law. So now um, towns are required to accommodate pets if they are opening a shelter, it doesn't necessarily mean they have to house the pets in the same building that the shelter's in, but they do have to accommodate. So if they have a shelter in the high school, they can, if they have space in the high school, and, and they can accommodate there, or they might use a local animal control facility mm -hmm. and put the pets there, and then you just shuttle people to visit their pets. And uh, Worcester County has a DART team, which is a disaster animal response team that goes out and responds if we have to open shelters to help set that up. And they have cages mm -hmm. and yes. ways to register the animals and everything else. Yep. So, so again, it's not if, but when. Keep in mind that something will happen eventually. So it's best to be prepared. So are you ready? Um, you want to make sure you're informed, you know, keep, keep an eye on what's going on. Know what resources your community has. Uh, make sure you're, you have signed into your reverse 911 or whatever alerting system you have. Know what risks. Are you in a floodplain? Um, you know, if you're, if you're at the coast and you're even on Cape Cod on the vacation, are you in a hurricane evacuation zone? Do you know where you're supposed to go? Um, you know, do you have hazardous material? Are you, near, are you near a highway or a railroad track um, you know, where there might be some hazardous material issues? Again, know your community's alerting systems. Um, pay attention to weather warnings. Call 211 with questions during emergencies. So 211, I can hear the train. See, there's so a railroad here. Yeah. <laughs> so that's yeah. one thing to keep in mind yes. if the train yeah. derails. Yeah. Um, 211 is, a, is an, an emergency number. We don't, we don't want people calling 911 to ask questions. And, that, and yeah. the mm -hmm. police, that is one of the, um, the things the police say is they get a lot of calls right. during an emergency asking when the power is going to be back on or you know, what roads are closed or where is the shelter. That's what 211 is for. So you would call, the, your community can leave a message with 211, here's all our emergency information. Residents can call 211 and say, you know, I live in Northboro 
and they can read what messages are there for you, tell you where your shelter is, what the hours are, things like kind of that. Central messaging. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep, for non emergencies. Do the schools, now I'm thinking about children in the schools, what do the schools get for warnings? The same. And how do you contend with that? Um, for like what type, for like weather warnings or? Yeah, or any emergencies that are coming up. You've got a lot of kids in school. What's the procedure there? Well, generally, um, if, there's, if there's something that is a known risk, you know, like we, you know, hurricanes are something we know yeah. that's coming ahead of time, mm -hmm. the schools are generally uh, follow that. For an unknown, like say it's a tornado and all of a mm -hmm. sudden there's a tornado warning, mm -hmm. they get warned basically the same way that everybody else does through the, through the alerting systems. Um, schools are all required to have their own emergency plans. Oh, okay. So schools have, um, multiple emergency plans um, because they have plans not only for natural hazards mm -hmm. but they also have ones for you know active threat issues oh, you know okay. um, and a lot of times they shelter in place yeah. they also most of them have reunification plans so if something happens and they have to leave the school they usually have a place identified where they can bring the students to and how to reunify them with their parents mm -hmm. um, because uh, you know there's you know, making sure the right kid goes home with the right, right. parent yeah. mm -hmm. so schools are pretty schools are pretty good about that it, it's part of their requirements um, oh. for their licensing to have to have these plans in place and they keep in contact with your local emergency management director oh, okay. so mm -hmm. there is communication, oh, there yeah. is communication. Okay. Um, yep. they actually you know in the communities with their you know, local emergency management director, police department, fire department, usually the school officials, you know, work with them on a regular basis. They may even do some drills and exercises like while school's out, sometimes during vacations, whether it's winter time or in the oh, summer. I've yeah. seen where they've done some drills and stuff with them at that mm -hmm. time. So they are, they do work together and communicate Thank on a regular okay. basis. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Speaking of schools in our community, Mellican Middle School is the shelter for this community because they have emergency power backup. Right. Yep. And generally, during a larger emergency, w once the emergencies happen, schools are going to be canceled. So most most um, communities, their schools are their primary shelters because you're not going to put right. the kids yeah. back in school. You know, sometimes, you know, the schools. Um, We've had it happen actually. Yeah. So up in in the Berkshires in 2011, when uh, Tropical Storm Irene came through, there uh, in Williamstown there was a whole trailer park area that there was between 250, 300 residents there mm -hmm. that all lost their home from flooding. And so it was an isolated area of town, but it was devastating for that area that got hit. So the school was used kind of that recovery center, like how we talked about, we're doing one for the fire in Fitchburg. Well, we did that for those people as well. And school was still going on. And what is the sectioned off? Like we just used the gymnasium. No. So we were in there and we had, because that was our year of many disasters in 2011, we already had FEMA in oh, state because yeah. <laughs> the tornadoes had happened two months prior. So, you know, FEMA was right there and um, so that's where we started off. So they actually still ran school because wow. the year had just begun wow. and yeah. just kept everyone that was coming to the recovery center just to the gymnasium area. Wow. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. But towns work on that. Do you want me to keep talking or do you want? I can step in if you want. <laughs> Uh, so did you build a kit yet or not yet? No, okay. build a kit. So building a kit too, as we talked about, you want to be prepared to be self-sufficient for the first 72 hours. So we tell people that, you know, you should build a kit. It doesn't have to be anything super fancy. It doesn't have to be anything super expensive. You could just get one of those, you know, Rubbermaid totes, you know, from Target or whatever, and put items in there that you're going to need, whether it be obviously, you know, the obvious that people know, food, water, things you're going to need if you can't get out to the store, but also to, you know, think about your own personal self and your own, how your own family is. Do you have pets? If you have pets, make sure you put stuff in there for your pets as well. Are there medications that you need to take every single day? You know, maybe, you know, set some medication aside, have some medications in there. We tell people, you know, every six months to a year, kind of go through your kit, um, use up those items and replace them with new ones. So that way you just don't have like expired stuff sitting there forever. Mm -hmm. So that way it kind of rotates things through and you don't waste a bunch of food and medicine. Um, but you have it set there for yourself. And again, it, again, it's something that doesn't have to be, 
you don't have to go out and buy you know four hundred dollars worth of stuff at a time. Yeah. Sometimes that can be uh, financial hardship. But if you say, okay, I'm going to work on getting my kit over the next six weeks, and every time you go grocery shopping, you pick, you know, you pick mm -hmm. up a couple yeah. more things, you can get it together in six or eight weeks, mm -hmm. and then still have it without it really being a, right. you know, a, yeah. a big outlay at one point in time. Yeah. And another thing too, um, we recommend to people is putting your uh, documents, such as like any homeowners insurance paperwork, uh, birth certificates, anything like that in a like a ziploc bag just in to keep in there as well or at least copies of those things mm -hmm. so you have copies of them so if something were to happen there was major flooding or yeah. you know you can you have the, those documents or copies of them saved as well because we have had circumstances where you know people didn't which i mean if we're honest a lot of us you know don't think about like oh i need to you know do that so you know something happens especially something quick and unexpected like say a tornado or something like that um and then you have to go and go through the whole process to get those all over again. So another thing too we talk about is having a plan. Again, you know, it doesn't have to be anything big and fancy, but have a plan with your family, with your neighbors, um, with friends. I had done a similar talk a couple weeks ago at the Senior Center in West Brookfield. And some of the people there were talking about how you know, they're good friends with their neighbors and they communicate with each other. And at times where they have had power outages, you know, there's one person's house that has a generator. So they all know everyone goes there and like, perfect. Like there's a plan. Doesn't have to be anything big or complicated, but you've made a plan. You guys communicate and talk, um, especially, you know, if you have children and pets, as we kind of discussed too, you know, it's great to try to find out ahead of time information. We know how crazy and hectic, hectic it can be when something bad has happened and everybody's trying to get the same information at the same time. Um, you know, phone lines may be down or might be spotty. So if you have a pet, maybe, you know, contact your community's emergency management director or your, you know, local fire department, someone to find out, hey, I've got pets. If we were to have a, you know, a storm, something to happen where we're going to be in a shelter, where would I take my pet? Do we have a designated pet shelter in, in our town? So that's another piece of a plan too you can find out. Or, you know, say if you have, you know, friends or family that live the next town over or maybe just, you know, other side of the town, you know, you can make plans to go, you know, stay with them. If something were to happen, can my dog stay with you if we have to go into a shelter? So things like that. Um, again, doesn't have to be anything super complicated. We did bring a couple of pamphlets with us tonight. You can take, we have one, this is made by our, our agency. So this is Massachusetts specific. Oh. And then there's one that FEMA puts out and it's about preparing and making a plan for yourself and your family. So we have those there you can take with you. So here's a picture, an example of an emergency kit that someone put together. Again, doesn't have to be anything fancy, but you have stuff in there such as water, food. Again, you oop, and now we got our so a little pet kit there. Um, you want to have some bleach, you know, trash bags, uh, bug spray, things you may not think of, um, and even like sunscreen. Because I got to say, when the 2011 tornadoes came through Western Mass, I had gone out with them a day or two later with FEMA and some other uh, MEMA staff members, and we were walking some of the neighborhoods in Springfield. And these neighborhoods like pretty much had no houses left, like foundations were, that was basically it. And there were some people that were, you know, they're traumatized, it's traumatic, and didn't want to leave even though their, their home was physically not there, they didn't want to leave. But it was blazing hot outside, and so people don't think like, oh, you know, sunscreen, what if something happens in the summer and you're outside, and you're gonna get really sunburned, because I remember myself, I got sunburned that day being <laughs> out there, so. So stuff like that you don't normally think of, band-aids. I think we got Kermit the Frog band-aids in there. So it's nice and fancy. Um, and then, you know, non-perishable items. And again, you know, considering whether you have pets, young children, babies, some of those babies, they want to have some extra diapers or wipes, baby food in there. Those are the type of things um, that you're going to want to put into your kit. And like Bonnie had mentioned, it's something you can build over a, you know, a month or two's time frame. You don't have to, and honestly, a lot of us can probably look at home and find a good third of that stuff up that we already have. Like, oh, hey, I can just put that in there. I don't have to go out and buy something new. So something that you can just use as a work in progress. And we can't forget our little friends, <laughs> our furry little friends. Um, just to remember for them as well to have water, food, 
um, their whoop, medical records as well, um, and having uh, their licenses, dog tags, any medications your pet may be on, you wanna do the exact same thing for them that you're doing for yourself. Yeah, especially it's good with the, with the, um, the rabies certificates and everything else, make yeah. copies of those, especially if you're trying to bring them to a shelter. Yes. They're gonna, they're gonna wanna see those, the rabies certificates and, and everything else. Yep. Yeah, and that's one thing too, um, when you're at, if your pet's at the shelter, and even like say, well, it is at the same location. So say it's at, you know, a high school or middle school and one wing has been set aside as a pet shelter and they set it up there. You know, they'll bring in food because um, they know obviously people aren't going to be lugging food in for their pets at this time when they probably, you know, don't have access to, <laughs> to much stuff. If things are so bad, you have to stay in a shelter, you know, you don't have access to a lot of things. So they will provide food and stuff there for you, but you're still responsible for taking care of your own pet. So you still would, would you know, walk your pet, um, go there to feed them. You know, they would supply food, but you go feed your pet. And again, that's another reason too, to make sure you have, if your pets have medications, to have those medications for your Are pet. Are they in kennels each pet? Yep. Just, oh, okay. Yep. So they're not kind of like running no. around. No, <laughs> and it's not. That'd be trouble. Yeah, no. And there, are, and there are restrictions to what type of pets too. You know, that they'll, yeah. you know, cats, dogs, bunnies, guinea pig, you know, things like that are fine. If people are coming in with, bowl constrictors, yes. those usually aren't. So even those people that do have those type of pets, for them it's even more important to make a pl to plan right. to find out. I mean, it's still their pet, although most of us might be like, oh, I don't want that as a pet. It's their pet, so they may want to figure out, like, where can I take this pet? Because it's not going to be able to go. birds and fish? Um, I, fish, yeah, I would think, like, if it's a smaller. Yeah, like, I, it's going to be hard to move a, a full aquarium if you're yeah, trying to I, evacuate. Yeah. Well, if someone has, like, a fish bowl and they want to bring yeah, a fish, that's, yeah. that's fine. Yeah. That would be fine. It's when you get into, like, like larger animals or more, than oh, animals yeah. that need more specific care. So even if you do have large, if, say you have a horse, you have property and you have, you have a barn right on your property and you have a horse. That's something, too. We tell people, try to make plans. Reach out ahead of time. So... Oh, wow. You know, it makes things a lot easier and takes a lot of stress off yourself too. You're already going through enough and it's a stressful situation. If you're um, dealing with a natural disaster or something else happening, that's one less thing you have to worry about at that time. All right, so again, being prepared is like knowing your, your, um, where you live, what type of uh, natural weather incidences you know you could, whoop, could be prone to. <laughs> Here, um, we talk about hurricane preparedness. You know, we do get hurricanes up here. We've been lucky, let's knock on wood so far, <laughs> um, not to get anything this year. But uh, one thing with hurricanes, those type of disasters, we usually, we have a little lead time. We, we know coming up, we know a few days out that it's coming. Gives you a little more time to prepare, unlike some other sudden like tornadoes that happen with very little notice. So you can, you know, go and, you know, build your emergency kit as a storm approaches, make sure you're staying informed, paying attention to the news, paying attention too to your local news and local information for your town as well. Because your town is probably gonna be, you know, obviously not, it's gonna be preparing as well. So they'll probably be putting out information even ahead of the storm in case, you know, you need to go to a shelter where we will open the middle school in case, you know, you're without power and you've got, you know, medical equipment that needs to be charged, you can come to XYZ. So it's really important to, to stay informed. And in. in a lot of towns these days, they're making use of the social media. Mm -hmm. So yeah. most towns have Facebook page, right. Twitter page, local yeah. TV. Um, so, you know, those are, those are really good avenues. Yep. Um, and even after something happens, um, a lot of the times that might be the best way to get information, especially if, you're, you know, your power's out. If you, you know, have a phone, you, might, you know, Facebook and Twitter are, are a lot of the ways that um, the information can get out after. I would think some families also need to be concerned about maybe elderly parents or yes. elderly neighbors. Yep. Or, or if somebody has a disability, maybe they only they need a wheelchair. Or Absolutely. Then that's something to recommend anyone that has any um, health, medical, mobility mm -hmm. um, conditions, things you need to put into consideration. That's another important piece of putting into your plan for yourself and your family um, because you're going to want to know you know, if you're someone that is on oxygen, you know, or somebody that relies on a walker or a wheelchair and you need, you know, to be somewhere where you have, it's easier access, which that's one thing you have to say in the towns, all their shelters, they are accessible. So 
they can, you know, there's, there's access for people that do have wheelchairs. And also there is, and for shelters and shelter layouts, and we do a sheltering training for communities, um, there's a way to lay out cots. So there's cots that are a little bit larger for people with uh, medical issues um, that may need a little additional space. We actually give them a bigger area so they have space to have their durable medical equipment right next to them or their service animal because that's the one thing a service animal can go into the human shelter mm -hmm. with their with their people but it's only service animals not comfort animals so the only questions that can be asked of someone that comes in they say it's a service animal you can say has this animal been trained to perform a job and what does this animal do for you and that comes down to pretty much dogs and miniature horses. Yes. <laughs> so those are the two that will be allowed in if they are a service animal, mm -hmm. can go with their, um, with their owner, with a companion to help them. And there's areas made for them. A comfort animal would have to go in the other Right. Area. Correct. And you can go be with your animal, sure. but, um, but it does have to go in with the other pets. And, and another thing too, for people um, that might have special needs during, um, a disaster. A lot of communities have registration, mm -hmm. so you can register with your local emergency management or your fire or police, mm -hmm. um, depending on where that registration is, so that they know ahead of time that you know these are these are people that might need uh, extra mm -hmm. help. Yeah. Um, also, if if you have um, medical equipment that does require electricity, you can also register with your electric company, uh, your utility provider, mm -hmm. and then they generally you are moved to the top of the list for restoration. Is, one thing to think about yeah. yeah so making sure to be prepared keep informed or in having your plan are key items so another program that is out there this was actually put out by fema um fema region one which is our region that region one covers all new england they piloted this program in nashua new hampshire called until help arrives this is online so you could actually even go home tonight and Google until help arrives, you know, or until help arrives FEMA, and it will pull this up for you. This is a program that's been put out there to train people, the everyday people that don't work in, in as first responders or don't work in the medical field, what they can do if they're the first witness of, so if you're right in front of someone like that had a heart attack or you see a car accident that happened, what you can do to help save that person's life until professional help arrives. So this has been a very successful program. It um, did very well after it was piloted in New Hampshire, mm -hmm. and then it was brought to some of the other, actually we might have been one of the next states that came down to was Massachusetts. And FEMA came and trained us on it, and so we could go out and train um, community members. This program is great. We go over, um, so here it is. You are the help until help arrives. The program is designed to educate the public about the important role they, are play, they play in providing immediate care to those who have experienced life-threatening injuries prior to the arrival of emergency services. We talk about um, scene safety. So if you witness a car accident or someone that was up on a ladder cutting tree limbs that falls down, before you, you know, instinct kicks in, you want to run over and help, like take a second and make sure it's safe. Okay, you saw a car accident. Is it in a busy roadway? Are there car, other cars coming? Make sure you just don't run out. Um, we have a picture. So we have a few slides in this training program. Where we tell people just observe what you see. What do you see happening in this picture? And when we see a, a man falling from a ladder of the tree, he was cutting limbs, kind of like, ah. So people are like, oh yeah, you see, you know, the person's falling and the ladder doesn't look stable. That might be falling. We also had a chainsaw in his hand, the chainsaw is falling. So it's like, you want to kind of pay attention to your surroundings. We talk about the safe way, uh, when you should move a person. If a purchase person is conscious, alert, and comfortable, and they can breathe, don't move them, just let them be. Um, if someone is in harm's way, obviously move them. We can tell you how to position a person. Um, and also the importance if someone is losing a lot of blood of what you can do to help control that bleeding until the first responders come. That's probably one of the most mm -hmm. serious things because they talk about our body has about five liters of blood in it and after you lose about half of that, your body goes into a state of irreversible shock. And it's been called irreversible because you can't, you can't come back no matter what kind of treatment you get. But when people have stepped up and, and one of the slides in there does show a picture of Boston Marathon of people that came up and took off their belts and were making the improvised tourniquets saved a lot of people's lives. So we talk about, you know, putting pressure on someone when you should put a tourniquet on. 
Do you, do you, as anybody here know the proper area, the areas you can use a tourniquet? Yeah. I like to say, you know, as much as it may be someone you don't like, like your horrible mother-in-law, like if they're cutting, if they're bleeding on their neck, don't put a tourniquet on their neck. That's not a good thing. But um, if it's the arms or legs, you put the tourniquet on them and you would go above the wound. Um, it's so you want to go above where they're bleeding from. If it's anywhere else in their body, then you would just apply pressure. So you get, you know, towels, if you can, whatever you have. And if nothing else, just at least apply pressure until the first responders come or until you physically just can't do it anymore. I would think electrical lines also might come into play right. depending on it. Yes, that's, so that's actually another so slide that's in there too. <laughs> it's not in here, but no, it's not in here, but it's in that training. That's exactly when we show a car accident, a car crash into right. a pole. Right. And then we say, what do you see here? And there's lines down. Wow. So yeah, you don't want to go running over if there's, because <laughs> you're going to be the next emergency that happens if, that, if that's the case. And that's where we tell people if it's a circumstance where it's not safe for you, because it's not always safe, you may want to help. You know, people almost always have the best intentions and want to do everything they can to help. But sometimes that just may be calling 911 right away. That may be the best thing for you to do. You hear these and that's tragic what, stories, I'm sorry, about yeah. somebody helping somebody on the side of the road and then they get yeah. hit. They become a victim exactly. too. Yeah, and it's sad, it's terrible. And, and that's why we try to educate about scene safety. Um, and, and as much as you want to run over to help, Call 911, get, you know, and get the responders there as soon as possible. And then even if you can't go right up to the person, like say the person's here and it's, there's a line down, but they're alert, talk to them, let them know, like, I'm here for you. I've called, you know, 911, their help is on the way. I'm not gonna leave you. Even just the comforting words and staying there, even if that's all you can do, doing that helps a lot. Right. And don't assume just because you see people with phones that they've called 911, because a lot of times they haven't. And a lot of times, unfortunately, they're just filming. Um, so yeah. you always want to make sure if you see something, make sure you make that call to 911 because you don't necessarily know, unless somebody has definitely said, I have called 911, if, if no one, ha you know, you want to make sure that you, that call mm. gets, gets made. Yeah. So there's my contact information, but that actually the telephone number on there is to our office. So if you recall that number, you would get it. That's our main line to our office and you would get any one of us. There's four of us that work in the um, region three, four office. That's an Agawam that covers, again, all the central and western mass communities. Um, you know, is there any other questions that you guys may have? Something that maybe we didn't cover or something you want to, maybe a little more questions in depth regarding no, certain I topics? Curious, I mean, you, know, you hear about sometimes the National Guard gets called. Yep. Is that the governor that calls the National, or he determines when the National Guard gets called, or is that a yeah. or? That's the governor. So National Guard is through state, so that's the governor. That's the governor. Yep, okay. yep. And they- You interface with, it could be the, the, the Red Cross, the National yep. Guard, and other partners. Yeah, we work with uh, a lot of the volunteer uh, non-for-profit organizations like Red Cross and Salvation Army actually on a pretty regular basis. We've got a really good partnership right. with them. So we, we work with them even when there's not emergencies. We include them in our quarter, quarterly meetings we have with, uh, with towns. We invite them either as guests or sometimes even as speakers to talk about maybe some new initiatives and new programs they have out there. Um, that's a great thing. Like for us, that's the important thing is for our piece of our planning is building those relationships ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, telling people to, whether it's, you know, you making your own personal plans and relationships with friends and family, just like with us, with these organizations, we try to also do that ahead of time too, because the worst time to try to get in contact and meet up and with someone who's a time of emergency when you really need the assistance now, if you build those relationships ahead of time, um, it makes things go a lot smoother. Is it also true that now they're um, they're sending like social workers to some types yep. of events, you know, active shooter events, obviously mm -hmm. they need we mental are, health yep. emergencies as well. We do that actually at our recovery centers. Okay. So when we do, it doesn't even have to be a big, huge, like a national, a federally declared disaster. When we have large scale fires, which seem to be for the most part, fires and tornadoes is what we've been having to have our recovery centers for. Mm -hmm. And we always have someone there for, um, Department of Mental Health to help because people are, you know, traumatized. It could be someone before that's, you know, perfectly fine, doesn't really have any, you know, anxiety problems that they deal with on a regular basis, but you witness something traumatic, something brand new. So we always have um, someone there, people to talk to. And we usually also have someone from um, like spiritual care. So we have someone too that comes in 
um, to help with counseling and guidance as well through that. Um, chaplains from fire departments sometimes come, yep. Mm -hmm. And so we had fire chaplains come in at times. I know I worked with FEMA and the communities in the 2011 tornadoes. Um, there's a long-term recovery program. We actually got a grant from FEMA, it was a pilot grant. And the recovery for that tornado, and it wasn't even, and this is just talking about the personal side. I worked on the side that worked with the people that lost their homes, not with the towns and like roads, bridges. I worked on the people side. The people side, we went for a year and a half and it still wasn't completely done. So there's a lot that goes into it, for sure. Um, just so we get it out to the public data, um, the local emergency planning coordinator here in town is Mike Barowiak. Yes. And we can get maybe his name and contact information on the tape. He's not, yes. He wasn't able to come tonight, but yep. Mike, He's I know he meets here at the library. Yep. He, he, about twice a year, they have a yep. PC yep. meeting, and they do you know, like you said, tabletop planning and all of that. Yep, yeah, he's great. Um, he works with, like, we work with him. Yep. Um, you know, says so one of our towns that we cover. So he comes, like, these quarterly meetings I'm talking about and where we have Red Cross and stuff. So it's great because your emergency manager director has been to these and engages in that. So it's a great resource for the people in your community. Yeah. How are you planning for the scenario uh, that happened, I think it was in Florida, when there was a hurricane and um, elderly people weren't being, they couldn't keep their bodies it got very hot, there was no air conditioning. Like, is there a way for the community to be able to be mobilized to a place where enough hands could have kept those people alive? Um, well, Massachusetts is lucky um, because we have, um, it's called MassMap, and it's a organization of all the nursing homes. So, and rehab facilities. And, and, yeah. and, and yep. you know, assisted living facilities and everything. And they have a very strong mutual aid plan um, mm -hmm. that they've practiced and it, it's one of the one of the better ones around so if something because florida it wasn't all of florida you know a couple of communities so if that happened you know say the cape when they had the cape cod tornadoes and, and maybe they lost a couple uh nursing homes where they couldn't it was hot and they and they had to move people those plans are already in place they have identified every every um, nursing home assist living type facility has identified a place where they're going to move people to. They've identified the transportation ahead of time, so they know where they're getting shuttles mm -hmm. and ambulances and everything else. Family, it's I'm sure there yeah, there's family members. They could have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they've got actually that. Bonnie's right. Massachusetts actually has a really robust plan for that, which is awesome. Thank you so thank much. You so much. Oh, thank you for having us.